in this section of the course we're going to look at functional analysis which is pretty much the most important practical element of transfer pricing together with a comparability study because in the functional analysis we're going to accurately delineate the transaction in other words we're going to find out exactly what kind of transaction is it that we're trying to find comparables for in our comparability analysis right um, in order to do this we'll briefly run through the introduction to the functional analysis which we had before and then we'll go in depth into a functional analysis example given by the UN practical manual um, in that example we'll deal with the analysis of functions in other words who does what we'll look at assets and we we'll look at risks and we also look at the functional analysis of risks because that has become very important since the PEPS action we will relate the functional analysis to the selection of the transfer pricing methods um, this is a recourse requirement quite frankly I I, I think it is a little um, less relevant but we'll discuss it in, in, in any case in the sense that you know the transfer pricing method that you choose at the end of the day is is more dependent on the information that is available than on on the functions performed by the parties but in some in some sense one could say that 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 um, you the functions that are performed might determine the, 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 the availability of the information because someone else might simply not do it and then there will be no information available we will look at entity characterization and, and we'll go through this in, 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 in a lot of detail because it comes back when we deal with documentation and it comes back when we deal with for instance country by country reporting and here we will look what the typical um, FAR analysis uh, functions assets and risk analysis profiles of different types of entrepreneurs look like that we commonly come across in transfer pricing those being the manufacturers and the distributors and the principals and the R&D functions for example um, and each of those have their own variation typically determining on whether they low risk or fully fledged in other words they carry the full risk and that will very much um, also influence their, their, their functional analysis profiles and then finally we'll talk about taking practical approaches to functional analysis we might revisit a second example given by the UN manual um, and we'll talk about the day-to-day -day issues that one deal with in practice um, when dealing with function analysis I, I, I always say you know there's there's a big difference between for instance speaking or listening to in-house tax professionals compared to academics and consultants in the sense that consultants and academics would often talk about what they've read um, in-house tax people will talk about what they've done and we'll try to follow that approach in the practical approach I mean, to be fair to consultants many of them do um, transfer pricing documentation as well in which functional analysis obviously comes back and to the extent that it's not a copy paste exercise they too do get a lot of practical experience in dealing with these issues so let's get started and have a quick rehash of um, of what chapter 1d on 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 understanding the the, the the economic and financial relations between the parties in a transaction looks like through the means of a functional analysis let us look at how we recognize the actual transactions undertaken for transfer pricing purposes now first of all um, this is dealt with in chapter 1d of the transfer pricing guidelines and the first step is to identify the commercial and financial relations and, and, and what this actually means is that you really have to understand the transaction that you are analyzing right we'll get to this into more detail but before we do that let's just deal with a couple of other sub chapters in in chapter 1d um, the first is when you have analyzed the transaction it might actually turn out that the transaction is not the same as what the contract says that it is and uh, there is a two-step process first of all the authorities generally can deviate from the contract 
an accurately delineate the transaction and, and then say, you know what, this transaction commercially does not make sense. And therefore, we will substitute it for a transaction which is as close as possible to the facts as they are, um, but which is something different. For instance, it does not make sense that this is a loan. It has to be capital because it's unsecured, it is highly risky, and you wouldn't do it if you don't have full control over the debtor. Next step is losses. Um, there are authorities which say that uh, loss-making companies cannot be comparable. That's not true. Independent companies make losses too. So therefore, loss-making companies can be comparable. So the only thing is that you know, loss-making independents do something about their losses. They don't just accept them and go on forever and ever. Either they seize the activities or they do something different. Um, if you have a group company that's making losses forever, it's maybe because you want to be in that market. And then being in that market is a service that's provided which should be compensated so the company does not make losses anymore. Government policies again can create barriers to commerce. And here the idea is that related parties should do the same as unrelated parties would do. For instance, if you sell something to an unrelated party in a country, that cannot pay you in dollars or whatever because of FX regulations, then you will only sell to them if you can make sure that you get whatever they can offer in return instead of dollars for more or less the same amount as you would have expected in dollars. And related parties should do the same. They can't say, well, you know what? We're dealing with each other. This is the government rule. It's the law. We can't help that we can't pay each other and now we don't pay each other. Unrelated parties would never do that. Customs valuations. Customs typically have their own rules for pricing transactions. And what the guidelines here say is they may be different, but they could still be useful. And therefore, um, it might be interesting to look at them because on the one hand, you know, and for Toronto pricing purposes, you want the price that is as high as possible because you're selling into a low tax country. Um, or high tax country. Um, however, for uh, for customs purposes, you might be interested in having a price as low as possible because you're trying to avoid the customs duty. So the guidelines also suggest that um, at a government level, customs officers and transfer pricing officers exchange information with each other about transactions. Location savings um, and uh, market advantages are Things that are comparables, they um, are not things that a taxpayer can own, but they can influence the pricing. Um, and when looking at these things, first of all, let's take something like location savings. If you can make something much cheaper in China than you can in, for instance, Holland, um, the question is who is getting that saving? Is it the company in China that's making it? Is it the principal in Holland that's getting it? Or actually, is that saving passed on to the customer in the form of a lower price for the product? Now, obviously, if it's the latter, then it doesn't make sense to allocate that profit to either of the former two. Um, so one needs to know what's going on there. The same more or less applies for assembled workforce. You can have uh, a very well-functioning team of researchers that are very used to each other, and you may transfer them from one group to another. When doing so, one should consider what it would cost to set, up, to set up such a team again and put that into the pricing of the transfer. One should also, for instance, consider whether this team of researchers have extra know-how, which is an intangible, which gets transferred along with them. For instance, they may know the procedures um, far better than anyone else in terms of either making submissions to governments or how it works internally or any other kind of intangible. One should just consider whether the assembled workforce themselves, the employees, do not take with them know-how when they get transferred. And the final point is group synergy. For instance, I might be able to borrow from a bank at lower interest rates than other companies of my size simply because I belong to a much larger group. Now, should I pay someone within the group for that benefit? And the answer is basically no, you don't have to, unless you get that benefit because the parent of the group, for instance, gives an explicit guarantee to the bank or implicit, right? The same would apply for, the, for using the group name. Do you have to pay for using the name Coca-Cola if you belong to the Coca-Cola group? The answer is uh, no, unless in some way there's deliberate push for you in particular to benefit from that name.
So let us get back to um, identifying commercial and financial relations or, as we said, understanding the actual transaction. This is a five-step process. First of all, you've got to look at the contractual terms. You've got to see you know, what is in the deal because one contract may differ from another. For instance, a contract that includes a guarantee is worth more and will influence the price than a contract without a guarantee for, for, for the service provider, right? Um, the same applies for product characteristics. If you sell a budget kettle compared to a luxury kettle, you should be expected to pay more for the luxury kettle for the, than for the budget kettle because it's made out of better materials. It might be assembled better, it might have more security features, and it may be built to last longer. Right? When it comes to economic circumstances, it might influence your pricing as well. Um, for instance, you may be operating in a market where there are lots of competitors, which creates a very strong downward pressure in pricing. And then you've got to consider that when you deal with your group companies as well and apply the lower pricing um, instead of, for instance, the higher pricing just because you're in a low-tax jurisdiction. And finally, there are business strategies. I mean, you may actually deliberately be making losses or very small profits because you are busy with a market penetration, right? And you decide, I'm going to enter the new market, I'm going to sell my profits, buy my products cheap so the customers get used to it and then I'll increase the price afterwards. So that could influence pricing and would also need to be looked at when understanding the transaction. And then the most important one, you need to do a functional analysis of the transaction. <clears throat> and the functional analysis is broken into three parts. It is first broken into what you actually do, right? The functions that you perform. And, and the functions that you perform may be more than meets the eye at first glance. For instance, if you are um, selling a product with a guarantee, then you're not only selling a product, but you're also giving a guarantee, right? You need to look at the assets used. If you're manufacturing a product, you have to realize that, you know, you're not just manufacturing the product, you're also, um, and therefore using the plant in making the product, but you're also using finance to build the plant, right? And you're using um, your employees as a resource in making the production. So you need to consider these things as well. And then finally, you need to look at the risks that you incur. And here is again, a, 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 the risks has been a, quite a large chapter which has been added to the transparency guidelines as a consequence of BEPS, because what taxpayers used to do is they used to say, you know, it would allocate risk contractually to a low tax jurisdiction, and typically a tax haven, and then it will say, well, because they carry all the risk, they have to get all the profit. Um, the problem would be that the tax haven company would be run by two bookkeepers, totally incapable of doing the actual business that we're looking at. Now, if you were to deal with something like that, then uh, you need to accurately deline delineate the risk allocation, and that's a six-step process. In the first step, you identify econ with, uh, with, with specificity the economically significant risks. And in the old days, it used to be quite simple. You talked about your debtor's risk for the, pro the debtor buying the product. You talked about your inventory risk for keeping the product. You talked about currency risk because it's a different country. And you talked about country risk in itself. Um, nowadays, the guidelines are far more risks that are described than, than, than just these old classics. Secondly, you need to look at contractually who is assuming the risk and whether the risk that is inherent in the contract is even, or in the, inherent in the transaction is even mentioned in the contract, right? And third, you have to then do a functional analysis on the relation to the risk to actually see who's, who's managing and controlling the risk. I mean, the fact that the contract says that country A is dealing with the risk doesn't mean that they have anyone in country A that understands the risk. It doesn't mean that they have anyone in country A that has any powers to decide on how to control the risk. I mean, first of all, you must be able to identify the risk. You must be able to, to judge what the chances are of the risk coming uh, in, 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 into realization. You must be able to make a contingency plan for if it comes into consideration, you need to decide whether you're going to insure yourself against the risk or not. And if you cannot make those decisions, then you simply are not controlling the risk. You can outsource functions regarding to risk, but then you must also control the outsourcing thereof. In other words, you must be able to hire and fire whoever you have, con have outsourced the risk control to, and you must be able to judge whether they're doing a good job 
or not. Um, and finally, you must be able to bear the risk. I mean, saying that you're bearing a risk of 100 million when you've got a share capital of 10,000 obviously does not work. Once you've done that, you compare the result of your fact finding under step three with the allocation of the risk um, under step two, and then you allocate the risk basically um, in the sense that where the contract matches the fact, then you follow that allocation of the risk. But where the contract and the facts diverge, you follow the facts, not the contract. And once you've allocated the risk between the two parties, then you can accurately go and price the transaction. Because remember, bearing risk costs money.